Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Ron's Amazing Stories. We have stories that should thrill you a little and chill you a little. It's amazing. What you'll hear are adventures sent in by you guys, classic stories from the pulp mags, and episodes from the golden age of radio. We have special segments like Ghost Stories with Sylvia. That's amazing. And these are your stories. So settle in for the next hour and enjoy the show. One more thing. You just might want to prepare yourself to be taken away from today. Another five-minute mystery. This five minute mystery is being brought to you by Cadaveric Spasm. That sounds awful. I agree. Why such a morbid sponsor? Well, you have to go with what pays the bills. How can a death grip expense finances? Just you never mind that. Okay, okay. Homicide Division, Inspector Nichols speaking. Who? Ralph Dean. The guy that backs all those nightclubs with his dough? Where? Right, I'll be there in ten minutes. So, you two are Thomas and Gerald Klein. That's right, Inspector. We're brothers. Where's the body? That's right, fellas. The coroner would like to make his examination as soon as possible. Uh, It's in this next room. You see, uh, we're both bachelors, and we have our living quarters here above the nightclub. Right in here, Inspector. Ah, Not much of a mess. Mustn't have been a struggle. There wouldn't be much blood in a death like this. Death was too instantaneous. As we said, Inspector, Dean came to Thomas and me and asked if he could come up here to talk over a business deal with this Johnson fellow. Dean had put up the money for his club, too, but Johnson wasn't cutting in with enough dough. Was Dean financing your club, too? Why, yes. But uh, to get back to the story, Inspector, uh, Dean and Johnson came up here to this room. After about half an hour, Thomas and I heard two shots. We happened to be in the kitchen just below here. We ran right up, but Johnson had beat it. But not before he stopped to plant my necktie in Dean's hand to frame us. Make it look like I killed Dean. How about that necktie in the victim's hand, coroner? It looked as though Dean ripped it off the neck of his killer. See, Johnson's a smart operator. He knew it would look that way. Can you remove the tie from his hand, coroner? Yes, if you want me to break his hand. It's a case of cadaveric spasm, Inspector. Dean has a death clutch on it, and the only way you'll remove it is by breaking the hand. Johnson must have gone up into our wardrobe, grabbed one of Gerald's ties, and torn it. Then put it into Dean's hand and forced the fingers around it. Yeah. Johnson was jealous of our business and was double-crossing Dean, so he thought this would be a way to kill two birds with one stone. He killed Dean and planted suspicion on us. Might as well store your alibi, boys. Johnson had nothing to do with this. Gerald, you fired the fatal shots as your brother Thomas stood by and watched. I'm arresting both of you for Dean's murder. Do you know what evidence proves Gerald pulled the trigger? In one minute, we'll be back with the solution. But first... I looked up cadaveric spasm. Oh, good. It is a rare condition where muscles stiffen and become rigid immediately after death. So the doctor indicated... Did you know, on his deathbed, Achilles realized that they were going to lose the war and uttered his last words? Defeat hurts. Funny. What does that have to do with the story? What does the story have to do with the story? Good point. You really should work on your spawn. Cadaveric spasm can happen in situations like assaults and drownings. And there you have it. Now, back to the inspector and his explanation. Johnson couldn't have planted that necktie, Gerald. That tie of yours in Dean's hand is the clue proving your guilt. As you walked close to him and shot, he grabbed at you, caught hold of your tie, and in falling, tore the tie off. When a person dies suddenly, as did Dean, they often clutch tenaciously as to whatever happens to be in their hands. Their fingers are set in an unmovable grasp. In that case, it's a medical impossibility for anyone to place something in the victim's hand 
and cause that dead hand to grasp it as tightly as Dean has your tie. That clue in Dean's hand is going to be worth two killers in the electric chair. If they can prove any of it... Agreed. I doubt that the tie will be enough to convict. For example, in an assault, the victim's hand might be rigid and clenched, holding on to the assailant's clothing or hair. OP, are you still reading about that? It's fascinating. Okay, note to self. No more post-mortem sponsors. Hello, and welcome to the podcast. Today's show has a historical theme. We'll start with a review of the audiobook, A Short History of Nearly Everything. This fascinating book explores the universe's origins and evolution from the Big Bang to present day. Next, we have two listener stories. The first is from Jake the German Shepherd, who miraculously sensed an explosion at Yellowstone National Park. Our second story comes from a couple who encountered a Civil War ghost during their vacation. They were at a historic battlefield when they were shot at by an invisible force. It raises some questions about the existence of spirits and the afterlife. Finally, we'll take a trip back in time with an episode of You Are There. This classic radio show transports listeners to historical events through the eyes of eyewitnesses. Today's episode takes us to the historic battle of the Monitor and the Merrimack, a pivotal moment in the American Civil War. We will hear from soldiers as they describe the intense fighting and the technological innovations that changed naval warfare forever. So join us for a journey through time from the ancient past to the present day. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. I love history. I love to research, experience, and listen to anything old or forgotten. Then, I like to take that and bring it to you. Over the years, we've played old-time radio shows, listened to speeches, even experienced events as they were recorded live. History is fun. But why? History is interesting for several reasons. It provides insight into the human experience, By studying history, we can better understand how societies, cultures, and individuals have evolved over time. History helps explain the present. Current events, social structures, and cultural norms often have deep historical roots. History is full of fascinating stories and characters. From ancient empires to groundbreaking scientific discoveries, The annals of history are complete with dramatic narratives, heroic figures, and intriguing mysteries. Ultimately, history's allure stems from its ability to transport us to other times and places. The study of history opens our eyes to the richness and significance of the past. Our audiobook this time takes this thought to the extreme. It is titled, 
A Short History of Nearly Everything by Bill Bryson, narrated by Richard Matthews. Imagine if you can, and of course you can't, is how Bryson opens his explanation of how the universe is born. And he has the uncanny ability to not say too much, nor too little, to use metaphors brilliantly, but without cliché, and to sound like he's actually learning as he goes along. Here is a clip from the introduction to the book. No matter how hard you try, you will never be able to grasp just how tiny, how spatially unassuming is a proton. It is just way too small. A proton is an infinitesimal part of an atom, which is itself, of course, an insubstantial thing. Protons are so small that a little dib of ink, like the dot on a printed eye, can hold something in the region of 500 billion of them, rather more than the number of seconds contained in half a million years. So protons are exceedingly microscopic, to say the very least. Now, imagine if you can, and of course you can't, shrinking one of those protons down to a billionth of its normal size into a space so small that it would make a proton look enormous, now pack into that tiny, tiny space about an ounce of matter. Excellent. You are ready to start a universe. I'm assuming, of course, that you wish to build an inflationary universe. If you'd prefer instead to build a more old-fashioned, standard Big Bang universe, you'll need additional materials. In fact, you will need to gather up everything there is, every last moat and particle of matter between here and the edge of creation, and squeeze it into a spot so infinitesimally compact that it has no dimensions at all. It is known as a singularity. In either case, get ready for a really big bang. Naturally, you will wish to retire to a safe place to observe the spectacle. Unfortunately, there is nowhere to retire to, because outside the singularity there is no where. When the universe begins to expand, it won't be spreading out to fill a larger emptiness. The only space that exists is the space it creates as it goes. It is natural, but wrong, to visualize the singularity as a kind of pregnant dot hanging in a dark, boundless void. But there is no space, no darkness. The singularity has no around around it. There is no space for it to occupy, no place for it to be. We can't even ask how long it has been there, whether it has just lately popped into being like a good idea, or whether it has been there forever, quietly awaiting the right moment. Time doesn't exist. There is no past for it to emerge from. And so, from nothing, our universe begins. In a single blinding pulse, a moment of glory much too swift and expansive for any form of words, the singularity assumes heavenly dimensions, space beyond conception. In the first lively second, a second that many cosmologists will devote careers to shaving into ever finer wafers, is produced gravity and the other forces that govern physics. In less than a minute, the universe is a million billion miles across and growing fast. There is a lot of heat now, ten billion degrees of it, enough to begin the nuclear reactions that create the lighter elements, principally hydrogen and helium, with a dash, about one atom in a hundred million, of lithium. Okay, that probably sounded heady, but I assure you that is not the intent of this book. Bill Bryson is one of the world's most beloved and best-selling writers. In this book, he confronts his greatest challenge, to understand and, if possible, answer the oldest biggest question we have posted about the universe and ourselves. From the Big Bang to the rise of civilization, Bryson seeks to understand how we got from there, being nothing at all, to there, being us. To that end, he has attached himself to a host of the world's most advanced, and often obsessed, archaeologists, anthropologists, and mathematicians. He traveled to their offices, laboratories, and field camps. He has read, or tried to read, their books, pestered them with questions, and apprenticed himself to their powerful minds. 
A short history of nearly everything is a record of this quest and is sometimes profound, sometimes funny, and always is a clear and entertaining adventure into the realms of human knowledge as only Bill Bryson can render it. Science has never been more evolving or entertaining. A bit about the narration. With his slightly bemused English accent, narrator Richard Matthews sounds completely at home in the material, chatting knowingly and with perfect dry comic timing. Overall, it's wonderful. Good grief, if I even had one textbook half enthralling in high school, who knows what kind of impassioned ologist I might have grown up to be. I hereby partition Bryson to rewrite all curriculum on behalf of the history of the world. This book is fun, wild, and unexpected, and if that appeals to you, head to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories and you can have it for free. Here is what Audible has set up for us. They are offering a free audiobook in 30 days to give you the opportunity to check out the service. You can stream or download thousands of included audiobooks, podcasts, and Audible originals in the Plus catalog. There's so much to do, you will never run out of material. So, to download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. You'll be glad you did, and you'll be helping me out if you do. Thank you, Audible. And now, it's time for your stories. These are your stories, sent by you, for you. I sometimes hang on to stories so that I can put a theme together. That is what we have today. All of your stories today have some sort of historical slant to them. Our first one is quite recent, in fact. It was sent in by Dolly Cordero from Taos, New Mexico. A geyser in Yellowstone National Park's Biscuit Basin erupted on July 24, 2024 at 3.08 p.m. And Dolly was there. Here is her story that she has titled, I Survived a Volcano. Hello, Ron. I just had one of the most amazing experiences of my life, and I decided to share it with you. Few can say that they've been part of a volcano explosion, and that is what happened to me. My family and I were vacationing at Yellowstone and decided to visit Old Faithful. While we waited, we took a trip down the boardwalk towards Black Diamond Pool. Our group consisted of myself, the two kids, my husband, and Jake, our German shepherd. I was holding his leash. Jake had been uneasy the entire trip. He kept wanting to head back to the pavilion at Old Faithful. He would turn, whine, and start to head the other way. I didn't know what to think. He has never acted like this. My husband said it was because it's hot, but I wasn't so sure. We were coming around a bend when Jake just stopped, sat down, and refused to move. I tried pulling on the leash, but he wasn't going to budge. It was just a few seconds later that the explosion came. If we had kept our pace, we would have been right on top of it. Tens of people came running towards us, screaming and yelling. This was followed by a pelting of rocks. We ran too. But the fact is, we were far enough away, thanks to Jake. We were not injured. Some folks were not as lucky. A few were scalded, and others were hit by larger rocks. However, as far as I saw, nothing serious. The question I had was, how did Jake know? But I'm thankful he did. After things calmed down, Jake returned to his normal self, and for the rest of the trip, while beautiful, was uneventful. Dolly Cordero 
New Mexico. I've heard stories like this before. Animals do seem to know that things are about to go sideways. Also, I've always thought that they see things differently than we do. Take my kitty, for example. There's this old heater that sits at the end of the hall. He sits on that thing for hours at a time, looking down that hallway. He'll move his head about like he's following something. My sister gave me a camera to monitor things around the house. I set it up one night to watch that hallway. There were quite a few movement alerts, most of which were my cat going down the hallway to sit on that heater. There was this one that had no explanation at first, but then a streak of light came straight at the camera. However, that was clearly a fly. Is my kitty just fly watching? I really am not sure. Our next story comes from Chandler, Arizona. It was sent in by Lindsay Daniels. They say that history comes to you, and that might be true, but sometimes you just have to go to history. Bull Run was the first full-scale battle of the Civil War. The fierce fight there forced both the North and the South to face the sombering reality that the war would be long and bloody. Although the Civil War officially began when the Confederate troops shelled Fort Sumner on April 12, 1861, the fighting didn't commence in earnest until this battle was fought months later. It is considered to be a Confederate victory. Here is Lindsay's story that she has titled The Ghost Battle of Bull Run. Hello, Ron. I love history and all that goes with it. My husband and I visit as many famous places as we can, and one of those was this past summer in Fairfax County, Virginia, the home of the Battle of Bull Run. On this site, over 4,000 soldiers were killed, and the shock of it all had the Union rethinking everything. It took place on July 21st, 1861. Whenever we visit any battle site, we are always taken in by the somber nature of it all. You can feel it the moment you step out of your car and look around. Without any trouble, you can hear the sounds of trumpet calls and horses' hooves striking the ground. Saber rattles and gunfire come next, and it all feels so real. If you don't believe it, just visit any battleground and you will. When we got there the first day, it was close to evening, and we planned to just look around for a few minutes and then head to our motel. We had a tour scheduled for the next day. People were leaving as we walked out from the parking lot. There had been some reenactment activity there that day, and lots of folks were dressed in both Union and Confederate uniforms, which, by the way, was incorrect if they were staging the first battle of Bull Run. We looked over the field and were just awestruck. It was empty now and the sun was fading behind the trees. It was then we heard a rifle report. A bullet whizzed by and struck a tree nearby. Frightened, we both ducked down and looked at each other. A man and his wife walked calmly past us and we told them, Get down! Someone was shooting! He smiled and said, Not for over a hundred years! They just kept walking without a care in the world. We stood and looked around. It was as silent as a graveyard. We went over to where the bullet had struck the tree. My husband took out his phone and turned on the flashlight. We searched every inch of that tree and there was no bullet. What happened? Did it happen? Honestly, I don't know. What I do know is that something shot at us, but apparently it was from another time. The rest of the stay there was fantastic, and the tour of the battleground was amazing. Lindsay Daniels, Chandler, Arizona Lindsay, that truly is an interesting tale, and I've not heard one like it before. 
I hope to one day make the trip to Gettysburg to visit that place. I've heard some crazy stuff happens there. Thank you for sharing your story. The Battle of Bull Run, also called the Battle of the First Manassas by Confederate forces, was the first major battle of the American Civil War. It was fought on July 21, 1861 in Fairfax County, Virginia, about 30 miles west-southwest of Washington, D.C. The Union Army was slow in positioning themselves, allowing Confederate reinforcements time to arrive by rail. Each side had about 18,000 poorly trained and poorly led troops. Also, there was the added problem of both sides having inconsistent uniforms. The battle was a Confederate victory and was followed by a disorganized post-battle retreat of Union forces. Not a great start by either side. Well, that's it for this time. If you have a story that you want to share, like Lindsay did, head to the main website at ronsamazingstories.com, click on the story submission banner, leave your story, give it a title, and please tell me where you're from. I'll read it if I can. Our featured story comes from the CBS radio series, You Are There. It was created by Goodman Ace for CBS. It portrayed an entire network newsroom reporting great events of the past. It ran from 1947 through 1950 and continued on television until 1957 with Walter Cronkite. The series featured various key events in American and world history, portrayed in dramatic recreations. Some of the events that were covered included the Battle of Hastings, the execution of Joan of Arc, the Spanish conquest of the Aztec Empire, and the signing of the U.S. Declaration of Independence. Many shows that were covered were related to World War II, these field reports had an emotional impact on listeners, as you might imagine. Also, some of the announcers on You Are There were real wartime correspondents during World War II. Our episode today comes from the Civil War and tells of the famous confrontation between the Monitor and the Merrimack. It first aired on March 4, 1948. You are there. Washington, on the dawn of the day that will see the decisive naval battle between the North and the South, between the Federals and the Confederates. CBS takes you back 86 years to the surprise engagement that ushered in a new era of sea warfare. All things are as they were then, except for one thing. When CBS is there, you are there. You are there, produced and directed by Robert Louis Cheon, is based on authentic historical fact and quotation. And now... CBS News in Washington and down the holiday. So heavy with foreboding and impending calamity. Here in Washington, there are grim faces at the White House, tight-lipped comment from officers at the Northern Department of the Navy. When reports first reached the Navy Department stating that the Merrimack was venturing forth out of Norfolk to challenge the Federal fleet, there were expressions of amusement and cynicism. Northern Navy officers laughingly imagined the ironclad as a humpbacked turtle grotesquely waddling her ineffective way through the rough waters. But then the Merrimack struck. Within a matter of hours, the northern sloop Cumberland was rammed and sunk. The 50-gun sailing frigate Congress was abandoned and on fire. And the 40-gun steam auxiliary frigate Minnesota was aground and helpless. At twilight, the Confederate ironclad retired toward Norfolk, leaving behind the question... What can be done to prevent the Merrimack from returning and destroying the entire northern fleet? That's the situation as we see it here in Washington this morning. However, CBS correspondent John Daly is now at Hampton Roads, aboard the frigate Roanoke, the flagship of the Northern Naval Squadron. So for a report from the actual scene of the expected naval battle, we switch you to John Daly aboard the Roanoke. 
Merrimack has not been sighted as yet. And here aboard the Roanoke daily, to daylight rather, is beginning to streak the eastern sky, but the sea is still shrouded in a heavy, swirling mist. Somewhere out in that mist, about a mile to my right on the rip raps, federal tugs are desperately trying to release the battered Minnesota from the shoals on which she grounded yesterday. Perhaps you can hear the tug whistles in the distance. Also to my right, hidden by the mists and the angry water of the roads, lie the hulks of the federal warships Congress and Cumberland, both of them sunk in yesterday's action. Right now, here on the Roanoke, every man jack is searching the curtain of mist that hangs over the sea, waiting and watching for the first sight of the Confederacy's juggernaut of destruction. The air is tense. The men seem calm and determined. There's no false optimism. The nearness of new fighting has produced a, a solemn, a quiet, well, almost a prayerful attitude among the officers and the crew. With me at our CBS microphone is Commander Prescott Singleton, one of the senior officers of the Roanoke. Commander Singleton, do you think that the Merrimack is on her way to attack the fleet again, sir? Foregone conclusion. Well, what did you think of yesterday's engagement? Well fought, I should say. Well fought indeed. Well, do you happen to know who is in command of the Merrimack, sir? Yes. Uh, Captain is Franklin Buchanan. I'm told he holds the rank of Commodore in the Southern Navy. Oh, a good man. Knew him before the war. Knew him well. Uh, shipped together, the two of us. I see, sir. I, uh, I'm rather disappointed in him, I might say. Disappointed? In what way, sir? Well, it's, it's difficult to put into words, but in the Navy, we have traditions. Very high and proud traditions, I might say. I just cannot conceive of a good Navy man skulking behind iron plates. Don't you consider the Merrimack to be a very ingenious ship of war, sir? Well, yes, but uh, it's, uh, it's not the way to fight upon the sea. It, uh, it, it's unethical. Well, might I ask um, what you would think if you were given command of an ironclad? Oh, I'd resign my commission first. Well, then you feel, Commander Singleton, that the Merrimack is not a legitimate weapon of naval warfare? Absolutely not. The introduction of new and novel methods of warfare I must treat with repugnance. Men have been fighting on the high seas for centuries, according to certain basic laws of strategy. Nelson, John Paul Jones, Drake. In short, sir, the sea is no place for experimentation. But, sir, can anything prevent the Merrimack from further ravaging the northern fleet? We will stand against her. We will fight her bravely and gallantly. Count on that. Our hopes, sir, shall rest upon the good lord, good marksmanship, and good, solid New England oak. Thank you, Commander Singleton. The mist is still very heavy hanging over the water here, and there's still no sign of the Merrimack. So this is John Daly aboard the Roanoke, now back to CBS Washington. This is Don Hollenbeck. A moment ago, you heard Commander Singleton, one of the senior officers aboard the northern flagship Roanoke, say that he knew the name of the Confederate captain of the Merrimack, and that raises an interesting question. How much advance information did the northern department of the Navy have on the Merrimack? Quincy Howe has just come from the Department of the Navy where he talked with northern officers. Quincy, was the North aware of the fact that the South was building an ironclad? Uh, yes, Don, they were. Uh, the Navy Department in Washington, through various secret agents, has known all along that the Merrimack, uh, the South now calls her the Virginia, was being rebuilt uh, as an ironclad. You say rebuilt. The Merrimack then isn't an original construction. No, it seems not, Don. The Merrimack uh, was a wooden ship in the American Navy undergoing repairs at Norfolk Harbor uh, when the fighting began. Uh, because the federal forces couldn't uh, tow her off anywhere to safety, they scuttled her before they evacuated uh, the city of Rono. Then southern engineers came along, uh, raised up the burnt-out hulk, and converted uh, what used to be a graceful frigate into this present ugly, iron coated monster of, of destruction. Well, then the North knew about the Merrimack in advance and didn't do anything to counter her because they discounted her power. Is that it? Yeah, that, that's about the size of it, uh, Don. Uh, now, now, in the considered opinion of every northern naval officer whom I've talked to, there's only just one thing that can stop the Merrimack, and well, that's a miracle. There's no defense against the ironclad. The way she could withstand the concentrated fire of even the most powerful batteries that the North has to offer on land or sea, well, that's, that's shown that she can defy every weapon that the federal forces now have at their command. Uh, then the Merrimack's iron plating permits her to get close enough to any opposing ship to drive home that ram of hers with deadly effect. Well, then, as it looks now, Quincy, nothing can stop the Merrimack. What then? Uh, the answer now just seems all too clear. Uh, the Confederacy will simply have broken the northern blockade. And just think what that means. Uh, up to now, the northern blockade of the southern ports, well, that's been the Union's most effective economic weapon against the Confederacy. 
The Merrimack, though, now threatens to destroy that weapon, and the result will be that cotton, cotton, the money crop of the South, will again start flowing across the sea, and in exchange, of course, the South will get cargo upon cargo of badly needed guns, ammunition, food, all the essentials of war. A victory by the Merrimack uh, would be likely to increase the war-making power of the Confederacy, oh, I guess maybe ten times over. Then there's this angle. England may decide to recognize the Confederate States of America as a sovereign nation and therefore entitled to all the international privileges of the belligerent. Another point, Quincy. What do you think this effect will be, the effect of the Merrimack? Now, what will it have on naval strategy in this country and around the world? Well, all I can say, Don, is everywhere I went, I heard people saying things like this. The era of the wooden ship is over. Every wooden war vessel now afloat. All the way from England's great ships of the line to the lowliest little corvette of the smallest nation. They've all become obsolete. Just in one day, we've witnessed a complete revolution in maritime warfare. And no one Excuse is me, Quincy, I'm okay. sorry. A message, uh, we've just got a message from Douglas Edwards at Fortress Monroe overlooking Hampton Roads. He has with him the wife of a federal officer who's just come through the southern lines. So we take you now to Fortress Monroe and Douglas Edwards. I'm in the correspondence room at Fortress Monroe. The young woman with me is Mrs. Lucy Creighton. Where is your home, Mrs. Creighton? Providence. Will you speak a little louder, please? Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, Mrs. Creighton, I know you must be very tired. You've had a long and hard journey, haven't you? Yes, I have. I've just come through the lines on a safe conduct path. I understand. But will you tell us, please, what you were doing in the South? My husband was wounded and taken prisoner at Fort Donaldson in February. It was only a month after we were married. They arranged to let me go see him. Mrs. Creighton, you were in Norfolk, Virginia last night. Uh, That's southern territory. Can you tell us, please, how the people there received the news of the Merrimack's victory yesterday? Well, we were very happy. They were shouting, dancing in the street. They had a torchlight parade. I guess it must have been like that in every city of the South. Mrs. Creighton, would you say then that the people of the South feel that the Merrimack is going to bring them victory in the war? Oh, yes. They were all saying that after the Merrimack thinks our fleet is going to go north and bombard Philadelphia and New York. They were sure it would do that. And they were yelling and shouting that the war would soon be over. Go on, please. When the Confederate officer who accompanied me last night took me back to the northern lines. It was like riding through a carnival. When I reached the exchange point, the southern officer kicked his hat. He was very kind to me all the time, very nice. He kicked his hat and said that he was so glad the war would be over soon and we would be at peace again. There is no doubt, then, that the morale of the people of the Confederacy has been lifted tremendously by the events of the last 24 hours. Oh, I would say so, yes. All the time I was traveling in the South, I never saw anyone laugh or act like they were happy until last night in Norfolk when the news of the Merrimack came. This is Don Hollenbeck at CBS Washington. We've interrupted Doug Edwards at Fortress Monroe because the Merrimack has been sighted. The immediate target seems to be the frigate Minnesota... Ken Roberts is aboard that ship, so now to the Minnesota and Ken Roberts. The Merrimack is in sight. We can see the Merrimack. Just a few moments ago, the sun began to break through the overcast, and like a curtain rising on a stage, the mist lifted to reveal the squat and ugly form of the Merrimack, not more than a mile or two away, breasting the foam-capped water. She looks like a slanting black roof afloat in a flood. The officers here aboard the Minnesota estimate the top speed of the Merrimack to be only five knots, so it will be some time yet before the Confederate ironclad comes into cannon range. I've also learned that the Merrimack carries four guns on each planting side, and one pivot gun fore and another aft, making a total of ten guns in all. Her sides are sheathed in four inches of iron plate. All the Minnesota guns here are primed. The crew has been supplemented by many survivors of the Cumberland and the Congress, and directly above us we can see the big land-based guns of Fortress Monroe, also waiting for the Merrimack to come into range. The uh, tugs are still pulling at the Minnesota, trying to get her free. The officers of the Minnesota and the tugs calling to one another as they cast line, tighten and pull, then recast, tighten and pull again. Up on the bridge of the Minnesota, I can see the officers clustered together, watching the approach of the Merrimack. They're a grim, silent group. Now, 
as I look across the water, I can see old Glory flying from the protruding mast of the Cumberland. Standing beside me is one of the survivors of that ill-fated ship, a young seaman taken aboard during the night after spending 14 hours clinging to a piece of wreckage. The Minnesota's commanding officer has given us permission to talk to him. What's your name, sailor? Charles Horman, seaman second class. What was it like yesterday, Charles? What was the feeling aboard the Cumberland when the Merrimack came up for the attack? Well, first off, we didn't think it was going to attack. We had our wash out on deck, and some of the boys were swabbing deck like as if nothing were going to happen. We didn't know. When, when did you clear for action? Well, it wasn't until almost she got into rain. Then what happened, Charles? Well, first, I don't know, but first I think the Congress started firing, and, and then we saw she was coming our way, so we began. Who was coming our way? The Merrimack. So we began firing. Did the Merrimack answer with her gun? No, sir, she didn't. It, it, was, it was crazy. She, she didn't fire, not until she was so close we could almost reach out and touch her. That's how close I think. And, and then she let go with her bow gun. The shot went right through us, right just fore and aft. Killed some of the boys, and those who were hurt started yelling and cussing. What happened then, Charles? Well, we fired everything we had out of then, everything, all the guns we had. And we could see our shells bouncing off the side, bouncing into the water. It was crazy, honest. And the Merrimack kept right on, coming closer and closer, and we couldn't even figure out what was happening. She just kept coming at it. And then it was like somebody or something had, had got under our ship and heaved us into the air. Into the air? Yeah. You couldn't see nothing, only hear wood breaking, and, and the other guys yelling, and we filled it over until the decks were awash. Go on, Charles. Well, when we righted, the Cumberland began to lift fast because our whole underbelly had been ripped by the ram of the Merrimack. Just a, a chunk chewed out, and the water poured in. That was on the starboard side below deck. After that, there wasn't anything to do but jump, so I jumped. Believe me, I, I didn't even think about it. When Lieutenant Morris, who was, who was deck officer, yelled for us to jump, I just jumped and prayed. When I got in the water, there was a bunch of spar floating nearby, and I got a hold of it, and that was how I managed to save my life. Well, there wasn't the gun to the Merrimack that did the big damage then. It was the ram. The ram. It, it was the ram. Thank you for talking with us, Charles Harmon. Now, here's another sailor from the Cumberland, but one whose experience was even more incredible, more dramatic. Your name, sailor? Kavanaugh, Jimmy Kavanaugh, Bedford Mass. Well, every man who witnessed yesterday's engagement, Jimmy, is talking about your heroic effort to board the Merrimack. Tell us about it. Well, look, I don't know. It wasn't anything. You were aboard the Cumberland. Uh, yes, sir, both of things. That's right. Go ahead, Jimmy. Well, uh, after we caught the broadside of the Merrimack, she came in so close that an officer on the Merrimack opened a porthole and yelled out, Surrender, Morris, or I'll sink you. That's Lieutenant Morris, deck officer of the Cumberland. Uh, yes, sir, that's right. And, and you know something? Here's something awful funny. It turns out that the officer on the Merrimack was a Lieutenant Jones who went to Annapolis with our Lieutenant Morris. Is that so? Yes, sir. Well, what did your Lieutenant Morris reply? Morris? <laughs> Morris yells back, never, never, I'll think first. But by this time, the Merrimack was under our deck. Actually, under the deck. So I jumped on it. I had two pistols stuck in my belt. And I jumped on it. They killed so many of us, you see. My boys, they were. A hundred were dead, you see, and the others screaming and yelling. Well, I, I guess I lost my head, I guess. All I could think was that I wanted to get to that man and get even, see? For my boys to get even. Yes, go on, Jimmy. So, I didn't even think, I don't know. It happened like that, see? I don't know. I jumped over on the man and and tried to climb her side. Get to the gun port. Uh, somewhere where I could see inside and let him have it with my gun. That's what I wanted to do, but... It was so slippery, like our greased forest. The iron was so slippery, I couldn't get a foothold or nothing. Every time I climbed up a little, I'd fall back in the water. Then I'd try again, fall back again. All the time, the guns over my head were shooting, and the bang was making me dead, so, so I, I saw it was no use, see? And then, well, by then, the Cumberland was rammed and sinking, so I dived back in the water and held on to some wreckage, and later they picked me up. That was a very brave thing you did, Jimmy. A hundred of my kids they killed. I, I, I wanted to do something. That's all I wanted to do, you see. I know your action will be well rewarded. If I could have gotten a toe hole. You see, it was like grease. The, the sides were so slippery. Let me see. Thank you, Boston State, Jimmy Cavanaugh. But now I have another sailor, a man who was aboard the Congress, who can give us a first-hand account of what happened there. His name is Pete Finley from New York City. Yeah, I sure wish I was there again. What's your rating, Pete? Ah, rating? Me? 
Uh, no waiting for me. I'm just a member of the Naval Brigade. Well, that's kind of like the militia, isn't it? Not regular Navy. Yeah, not regular Navy, that's right. Well, what were you doing aboard the Congress? You better ask that of Father Abraham. You mean President Lincoln? That's what I mean. It was him who put us aboard that leaky old tub. Were there many Naval Brigade men aboard your ship? Three companies. What about the regular crew? It was this time, four or five days ago. They were listening for stuff. We were put aboard to make it look like the ship was mad, I suppose. There wasn't even a single trained gunner aboard. Can you imagine that? So when the Merrimack, she let go of us, and we see the Cumberland going, so we run up the white flag. And you couldn't you... expect any different, now could you? I know. We've not been trained for fighting, if you know what I mean. Well, when it comes time, the white flag has gone up the mast, and I says to myself, I says, Petey boy, send the tank for you and over the side I go. Over the side? Yeah, you couldn't expect no different, now could you expect different? Well, tell me, Pete, do you know when you'll get another ship? Me? Another ship? With that thing, that, that iron boiler out there still wide and wild, oh, no, sir, no part of the water for me, not for Petey Finley. The land for me, and I'll kiss it, so help me if I ever get these big feet to feel the land again, I'll... I'm, I'm sure you will, and thanks, Pete. Yeah, I'm glad you're sure, mister. Wish I was. Now, looking out to sea again, the Merrimack looms near us, smoke belching from her chimney, an ugly, misshapen monster. The car is face to face between the The commander just given a clear ship for action. Men are running against the sun. Sorry, you have to go back. Can we stay here? No, get for us. Yes, sir. This is Ken Roberts. I'm returning now to CBS Washington. This is CBS Washington. We take you now to Jackson Beck, somewhere in Hampton Roads. Come in, Jackson Beck. Idea of where I was going, what I was to report. Under sealed orders, I was taken under escort to the Continental Iron Works in Brooklyn, New York. And here, for the first time, I was told of the nature of my secret mission. I was to accompany the monitor on his journey to Hampton Roads. And, uh, well, here I am. Now... What is the monitor? Well, I have by my side the young commander of this unique naval vessel, Lieutenant John L. Worden. Lieutenant Worden, suppose you answer that question for us. Just what is the monitor? Well, sir, we hope the monitor is the answer to the Northern Pearls. The craft of unique design, the idea of John Erickson, the famous Swedish-American inventor. It's iron hulled, surmounted by an armored circular turret, nine feet high, 20 feet diameter. Covered with eight folded layers of one inch iron. The turret and the little pilot house that lays forward are the only deck structures, except for smokestacks and exhaust grate, which we remove before going into action. I see. Uh, what about your armament, Lieutenant Worden, or is that restricted information? No, sir, it's no secret. We carry two 11 inch carbines. Well, the reports we have of the Merrimack say she carries 10 guns. Oh, yeah, that's true, but her guns are smaller than stationary. I see. Ours are fitted into a revolving turret. We can shoot in any direction without having to maneuver into a firing position. Well, then you think the monitor is an even match for the Merrimack, Lieutenant Worden? I think we're more than an even match, and we stand ready to prove it. Uh, can you tell us just how the monitor came to be here in Hampton Roads right at this crucial moment? <laughs> I guess, guess a good part of that is luck. Uh -huh. uh, we set out from Brooklyn three days ago. Our orders were for us to head for Hampton Roads at full steam. Last night, we anchored in the darkness off the Roanoke, and one of our officers... My second in command, Lieutenant Sam Green, went aboard the Roanoke for orders. No one knew him, and he received his orders from the Admiral in secret. Now, these orders were clear and simple. We were to take up a position near the Minnesota and defend her from attack by the Merrimack. Well, we anchored in close under the Minnesota's lee side so that we were hidden from sight. Now that the Merrimack is coming in range, we're sailing out to carry out our orders to defend the Minnesota. And we're going to do just that. How many men? What's that? Merrimack has opened fire. You missed. Merrimack's right, sir. Take over the firing turret, Green. I'm going forward to the pilot house. The Merrimack has opened fire. The first job, oh, missed us by some 20 yards, but the concussion of the shells is tossing the monitor around like a cork. Here in the turret, the gun crew is stripped to the waist. There isn't enough room for a man to stretch out his arms. It's hot in here, and it's going to get less hotter. The crew is getting ready to fire. I can see the Merrimack fire through a tiny slit in the metal turret. It is about 1,000 yards away. The snouts of her cannon are smoking from that first broadside, and the second one should be coming. Oh, yeah. Where is it? The monitor has opened fire. We have opened fire. The blast is deafening. The heat. I can't think of what I can think We are being hit. No doubt you can hear that. But the shells of the Merrimack are bouncing hard. The monitor is eight-inch 
armor is holding. This is CBS in Washington. The noise of the firing aboard the monitor makes it impossible to hear Jackson Beck, but John Daly aboard the northern flagship Roanoke has an excellent view of the action in Hampton Roads, so we switch now to him. Come in, John Daly, aboard the flagship Roanoke. The battle between the monitor and the Merrimack has begun. The Merrimack towering high above the water, and the tiny monitor, David and Goliath, the two ironclads, are not more than a few hundred yards apart now, flinging tons of iron at each other's sides. It's a fantastic sight to those of us who covered other naval engagements. Both fitted spars, so ripped wooden hulls. The Merrimack guns are firing at will, and they keep up a steady hammering barrage. The monitor fires one gun at a time at intervals. The very first blow that the Federal Monitor struck sent the Merrimack reeling backwards, but just for a moment. She came right back in again, and now she's letting go with every piece that she has, and incredibly, that shot is just glancing off the rounded turret of the Monitor without doing any perceptible damage, not a bit of it as far as we can see from here. The gallant little ship takes the full force of the shot without a tremor, without a sign of distress, and then she returns Every salvo with a blast of her own. A turret spins around as soon as one of her cannon is fired, and the second cannon is all loaded and ready to go. Right now, this fight has gotten so hot, the smoke is so thick, it's kind of hard to make out exactly what is going on, except that the two of them, the, the Monitor and the Merrimack, are actually standing toe to toe and slugging it out just like two bare-handed prisoners in the middle of a ring. Big blast of sound. They're just firing their guns as fast as they can load them. The Merrimack has just pulled out from the cloud of smoke, and she's leaving the monitor. You can tell the ironclad. She's coming in, they're going to try something. Then she's, she's going to try to attack the Minnesota, one of the hit federal ships. And here comes the monitor. The federal ironclad is sweeping in between the two of them, intercepting. She's forcing her ironclad in between the Confederate Merrimack and that wooden Minnesota. She's challenging the Merrimack. She's challenging her to come back and get combat once again. The Merrimack has lost a turn. She's lost a turn and is turning on the monitor, making full steam. The Confederate Merrimack looks like she's going to try to ram the Northern champion if she can. The two of them are almost deck to deck. But the monitor is sweeping aside. She's turning out of the path of the Merrimack. She's avoiding that ram, and as she turns, she keeps blasting away at the Southern Ironclad. That monitor is still in that fight. She's still in between the Merrimack and that federal wooden ship to Minnesota. Once more, though, that Confederate ironclad has been turned away from her objective. She's been turned away from the wooden sides of the Minnesota. And this time, the little old monitor seems determined to fight it out to the very finish. It's a terrific struggle, a battle of iron and steel. They're just blazing away. And the Merrimack is swinging around. Oh, she's slow and she's clumsy, but there's no question about it. She's turning. She seems to be heading back towards Norfolk. And there goes the monitor after her, just like a puppy chasing after a bill or a barking frantically. Yes, the engagement is all but over. The battle is over, and the northern fleet here in Hampton Roads is saved. The blockade of the south remains intact. There goes the Roanoke stand, and just listen to that band. It's playing the grand fury battle of him of the Republic, written only a month ago. And to be fair, neither the Merrimack nor the Federal Monitor was defeated. And neither one of them can really claim a clear victory. This great naval battle, which has just been fought so gallantly by the North and the South, is a draw. However, it's an unhappy day for the South. For as long as the Monitor stands here in Hampton Roads, Southern hopes of breaking the Federal blockade with the Merrimack are doomed. And the Monitor is going to stay here. This day, the door is so 1862. The monitor stops the Merrimack, and the Union fleet is saved. You have been listening to The Monitor and the Merrimack, another broadcast in the series, You Are There, produced and directed by Robert Louis Cheon. The Monitor and the Merrimack was written by Irv Tunick and Mr. Cheon. The cast included Anthony Kemble Cooper, Cliff Carpenter, Joseph Boland, Bill Quinn, Patsy Campbell, Court Benson, Jim Davidson, Bert Cowlin, and others. Next week, July 21st, 
1881, the surrender of Sitting Bull. You are there. This is CBS, where 99 million people gather every week, the Columbia Broadcasting System. So, how factual was that show? Not too bad, actually. The temporary withdrawal of the Monitor and subsequent exit of the Merrimack led both ships to believe that their opponents had fled and that they had won the battle. The USS Monitor was a big secret. It contained more than 40 new inventions when it was launched, and it only rose 18 inches above the water. The northern-built Merrimack, a conventional steam frigate, had been salvaged by the Confederates from the North Fork Navy Yard and rechristened the Virginia. With her upper hull cut away and armored with iron, this 263-foot masterpiece of improvisation resembled, according to one source, a floating barn roof. One way that you are there excelled was that it reported in such a way the audience was used to, and so it made it easier for the listener to participate in the world's major historical events. It was so good at times that people tuning in weren't always sure that it was fiction. How about that? I know all you young aviation fans and followers of Captain Midnight know a lot about flying and about flying terms. You know what it means, for instance, when an aviator says he's flying right on the beam. You know he means he's flying straight for his goal, exactly on his course. But let me ask you this. Are you right on the beam yourself? Are you getting where you want to go as fast as you can? Now, I'm talking about your health, your weight, your height. Are you getting stronger and huskier every day with more pep and ginger? Are you becoming more popular with your friends? Well, here's what thousands of smart young fellas and girls are doing to keep themselves headed in the right direction. They're drinking Ovaltine regularly, every day. You see, Ovaltine brings you vitamins and minerals and other things you need to keep yourself right on the beam. Food substances you often don't get enough of in ordinary meals. So if you want to keep racing along on your course, right on the beam like a high-speed plane, you just start drinking sweet chocolate-flavored Ovaltine two or three times a day. You'll like it. You'll really go for its taste. You'll say it's the most delicious way in the world to get the things you need to make yourself bigger and stronger and huskier. But now, don't put it off. Get a jar of sweet chocolate-flavored Ovaltine and start drinking it right away. And say, fellas and girls, be sure to have pencil and paper ready right after tonight's adventure when we'll have another big secret squadron signal session. That was episode number 651, and our stories were provided by Dolly Cordero and Lindsay Daniels. Thank you both. If you have a story to share, please do it. The coffers are getting low. If you want to follow the podcast or the blog, head to ronsamazingstories.com. There you will find any of the links I mentioned and how to contact us. Do you want to help the show? The best thing you can do is to tell your friends all about it and please leave reviews or feedback wherever you listen. Clicking that follow or like button helps us grow. Thank you for listening and I hope you come again to find out what are Ron's Amazing Stories. All of the vintage audio used in the podcast is believed to be in the public domain. Ron's Amazing Stories does not own the rights to any of the old-time radio used here. If you hold the rights to any of the shows played, please contact us immediately at ronsamazingstories.com.